The Holy Spirit is not for sale. In this message, we cover five important truths concerning anointed ministers and 11 truths on impartation of the anointing. Don't miss this. As we had mentioned earlier, these last three Sundays, 2014th, 21st, and today, we've been dealing with topics that are not easy and uh, we've, sometimes we don't necessarily deal with these things from the pulpit. Uh, we do it in other settings. Uh, but because of things that, have, that transpired in recent months, and we've had to address some things in the lives of our people in our congregation. Uh, we felt it's important that we uh, present this series of three messages uh, to everyone, uh, to all our locations, so that God's people can be uh, taught and equipped in this area, and, and, and we address this uh, uh, publicly. So this morning, continuing on what we've, so the first Sunday, 14th, we talked about spiritual fathers and mothers. Uh, it is a spiritual truth, but often we see it abused in the church, and then it hurts uh, many people. And so we brought the truth, the correct understanding of our spiritual fathers and mothers. Uh, last Sunday, we dealt with oh, the prophet's reward. Uh, we, we, we talked about the importance of honoring the least uh, uh, and not to be misguided or misdirected by uh, the prophet's reward. This morning, we're going to talk about the, light, the minister of God, the servant of God, the minister of God. The lifestyle, the anointing and impartation. Now, for some of you, uh, these, term and all, these terms may be new. You're wondering, like, what is all this? You've never heard about these things. Uh, what does all this mean? And so we'll hopefully uh, try to uh, state those things, what, it, what these mean. Uh, for some of you, you may be familiar with these things. And so you can connect it or understand this uh, much easier. But nevertheless, I think what, as we go through it, uh, if you've never been exposed to some of these things, this will come as an early warning, something that, uh, 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 that may be more preemptive, more precautionary. For some of us, we have been exposed to these things, so you will identify with what I'm saying. You'll be able to relate to it, and hopefully it'll be beneficial to us uh, as we journey forward. What we know and understand from Scripture, from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, is that the Lord Jesus has set in the church some people to be apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists. These are valid ministries in the church today. There are men and women who function uh, and have been appointed by the Lord Jesus Christ in the church, in the, in the body of Christ, in, the, in, the, in these functions. But like we said last Sunday, the purpose of these ministries is to, number one, verse 12, it says, to equip the saints. It's to equip God's people. It's to bring in enabling and teaching and training and building up of God's people. And for the edifying of the body of Christ. For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. So that God's people can be prepared to serve God. And for the edifying of the body of Christ. So that the church, the body of Christ can be built up. And it continues on there in verse 13. Till we all come to the unity of the faith. And to the knowledge of the Son of God. And unto a mature man. Unto the full measure of the stature of Christ. So that's the purpose of these ministries. But sometimes, uh, you know, while we recognize the validity or the, the, uh, the, the importance of these ministries, sometimes, and perhaps it is cultural or for whatever reason, we elevate these people to such high levels. So it's like Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and the preacher. We elevate them to levels God never intended. Now, please understand, I'm not saying we shouldn't honor them. They are people of God. We honor them. We respect them. Uh, we give them the honor that's due. But they are not at the same level as God Almighty. But unfortunately, we put them in that level. Whether it's cultural, whether we do it because of culture, or whether it's because of you know whatever reason. We somehow place them in that level and then we turn a blind eye to everything they say and do. As though everything they said and did was from God. But hopefully this morning as we go through this message, it will help us 
correct that and understand that yes, Jesus has set them as apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists. But at the end of the day, they're all people just like you and me. They are fallible. They are human beings, not demigods. So let's address this. What, first of all, what is God's standard for their lifestyle? What does God say? What does the Bible say about the lifestyle of a minister of God? That means what should their life be? So let's read scripture and then make some uh, uh, comments on that. This is what Paul writes in 1 Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 through 7. Paul is writing to a young pastor named Timothy. Timothy is in charge of the church in Ephesus. And so Paul is telling them, Timothy, if you're going to appoint a spiritual leader in the church, this is the requirement. And I'm just reading one passage, but you'll find parallel passages in 1 Peter chapter 5. You'll also find a parallel passage in Titus chapter 1. But we're just reading one passage and look at it carefully. What is the requirement for somebody to be a spiritual leader? Verse 1, 1 Timothy chapter 3. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. The word bishop simply means a spiritual leader. It is the Greek word episcopos, or where from we get episcopal, or somebody who's an overseer, spiritual leader. He's overseeing people spiritually. If a man desires to be a spiritual leader, he's desiring a good work. That's a good thing. But here's the requirement, verse 2. A bishop then must own a Mercedes and own three homes and a private jet, maybe more, have three Rolex watches and... Is that what it says? Let's read it again, verse 2. That was from the Greek, I think. <laughs> but the English Bible, sorry, just joking. A bishop must be blameless. The husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but, be ge but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous. One who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, that is not a new believer. Lest, being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. If you looked at it carefully, almost everything has to do with his lifestyle. Only one has to do with his ability. It says one thing, able to teach. The rest of the things has to do with how he lives his life. But now, here's the problem with the church. We only measure a preacher or a minister of God by the time he spends behind the pulpit. And we turn a blind eye to the life that he lives of it. But everything in the requirement has to do with the life he lives off the pulpit. And only one point has to do with what he does from the pulpit, able to teach. Are you with me? So what we must observe carefully in, in, in looking at ministers of God is that we must look at the person, the character, their life, their behavior, more than their performance, how well they preach, how well they teach, how, how exciting is the service. Amen. I'll say amen if you don't. <laughs> That's what the Bible is saying. I am not saying that the anointing is not important or, uh, you know, the ministry, the, the supernatural, the, the work of God. And the, uh, that, is not, that is important, of course, people are going to be ministered to by it. But the emphasis the Bible is giving us is look at his life. That's what qualifies him to come up to the pulpit in the first place. Are you with me? So we, as God's people, also need to make that shift. That let's observe the person, not the performance. Who is the person off the pulpit? 
rather than be so impressed only by the performance of what happens from the pulpit. That's God's standard and that's what you and I need to reestablish in how we look at the apostles, the prophets, the pastors, the teachers, the evangelists. Who are they when they're not behind the pulpit? Who are they when they are not under the anointing? Who are they when they're not preaching and teaching? Because that's what qualifies them in the first place to preach and teach and serve the people of God. So in view of that, we need to not be so impressed by some of the things that are being violated. For instance, the Bible says, a servant of God must not be covetous, must not be greedy for money. And we turn a blind eye to those things. So long as the performance is okay. But no, let's get back to what the Bible says. Let's emphasize what the Bible says. Amen? Now related to that is this whole area of anointing. Now, what, is, what does the word anointing mean? It means the empowering of the Holy Spirit coming through a human vessel, whether it's a man or a woman. The Holy Spirit empowers that person to serve God. That's the anointing. Now, when the anointing is moving or operating through the person, wonderful things happen. Very many times in spite of the person. Because it's God wanting to minister to his people. The anointing is moving through the person. Now, what I'm just going to make five statements in relation to the anointing. So this is not a complete uh, teaching on the anointing. We'll probably do that some other time. But I want to just make certain five statements to highlight areas where we need to come back to the truth, the truth, uh, understand the truth, especially in the context of a minister of God. The first thing we must understand concerning the anointing operating through a minister of God is that just because a person is called, anointed, and gifted, and manifests signs and wonders, does not mean they are infallible and cannot be in error. There are two different things. One is when the anointing is moving through the person, wonderful things happen. But when the person is preaching or teaching, he could actually be preaching and teaching error. It's hard for us to understand that that is possible. But I want, you understand, I want us to see it like this. When the anointing is moving, it's the Holy Spirit doing something through the person. But when the person is preaching and teaching, what they preach and teach has to be evaluated in the light of the rest of Scripture. These should be held separately. Because we've seen this in church history, and maybe we just mentioned two examples because it is possible for somebody to be highly anointed and to demonstrate wonderful signs and wonders and miracles and healings, which is all very good, but what they preach and teach is actually error. Now the problem with the church is this, we turn a blind eye to it because we say if a person is so anointed, everything he says, even if he burps, it has to be anointed. I mean, that's how ridiculous the church is. Because we put them up at such a high level and we don't understand the difference between the anointing and the ministry of the words. Take, a, for example, a man called John Alexander Dovey. How greatly used of God, he was one of the forerunners of the healing movement in the body of Christ. This was in the early part of the 1900s. And God, the, the, the ministry of healing, signs and wonders was so powerful that, that people so highly regarded him, John Alexander Dovey actually, as an evangelist, he actually built a city. Zion City in the state of Illinois was built by an evangelist. So he got into the real estate business and all those things. So people came. Why? God was working. But somewhere along the line, John Alexander Dovey started saying, I am Elijah the prophet. Now, was he anointed by God? Yes. Was God doing wonderful things? Yes. But what was he talking? Nonsense. But people were so taken up by this man 
And from then on, his whole ministry began to slide. Everything, he went bankrupt. All his businesses went bankrupt. People's lives were hurt. Uh, it was a mess. What can we understand? A man anointed by God, but preaching error and led a lot of people into trouble. Take, for example, another man called William Burnham. In the 1950s and 60s, a prophet of God, a true prophet of God. God was working so powerfully through his life. He could call out the details in people's lives, give you their, your home address, how you travel, details of what was going on, your past, your present, and, 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 and God would work through him through mighty healings and miracles and so on. True prophet of God, powerful work ministry. But as he journeyed, he started preaching some of the most ridiculous errors. One of the things that, have, that has troubled the body of Christ and is still prevalent today is the Jesus only doctrine. No father, no son, all one, Jesus only, has troubled the body of Christ. Errors concerning the last days. So much. And nobody could stop him because he was anointed. He was a prophet of God. It was very difficult to go and tell him what you're saying is not right. So these are just two examples are, uh, that, that show us that a man can be anointed, but he, a man is not infallible. What he says must be held, it must be evaluated in the light of Scripture. The second thing I want to talk about in relation to this anointing is, be careful when ministers start merchandising the anointing. Just for your information, the Holy Spirit is not for sale. Now God does, now both these terms are actually titles of books. One is called Merchandising the Anointing, written by Rick Renner. Another one is called The Holy Spirit is Not for Sale, written by Lee Grady, who is the editor of Charisma Magazine, a very widely distributed magazine uh, in the charismatic circles. But the point is this. God does work through ministers and he also uses things. He, uh, he uses oil, he uses the cloth, he uses all of those things. Uh, but what we have seen in the, uh, sadly in the Pentecostal charismatic church is people start using these things to make money. You find people saying, you know, here's a holy oil bottle. You need to give so much money to buy it. Now, it's okay if you're covering the cost of it. Yes, it does cost. If you're selling in thousands, it does cost to make the bottle and the, put the oil in it, pray over it, and all of that. So if you're doing it to cover the cost, okay. But when you're using that to make money, that's wrong. And that's just one example, or oil or cloth. So, yes, we believe God uses, uh, we, even we, we use prayer cloths um, and you know, when, when, when our member care teams go to the hospitals, they use it. Yesterday we had a great testimony. Uh, one of our pastors was sharing where uh, a man was sick in the hospital with fever for several days. He went and prayed several times. Nothing happened. But he took the prayer cloth. They prayed with him. And the next morning he was completely healed. So the man says, I want the prayer cloth. Where can I get it? <laughs> More of those. So people have that mindset. But now if we leverage it and say, well, each prayer cloth, 1,000 rupees. First one was free. <laughs> I mean, we don't do that. It's just a point of contact. It's something to help you, uh, you know, release your faith. That's all. There's nothing magical about that piece of handkerchief. It was just bought somewhere. <laughs> you know? But when people start merchandising the anointing, here, we will give you these things. You will get some of the anointing through this, pay huge amounts of money. That is wrong. But it's so sad that we don't have the discernment or the strength to say that is wrong. You cannot sell the Holy Spirit. You cannot sell the work of God. In fact, the Lord Jesus, when he sent his disciples, he said, go he, Matthew 10, 7 and 8. He said, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, charge thousand rupees for every healing. No, he said in Matthew 10, 8, freely you have received, freely give. God's work cannot be bought with money and shouldn't be sold for money. Jesus said, do all this freely you have received, freely give. Now yes, people will want, you need to eat food and so people will support your ministry, but let them do it out of their own heart, not because you want to sell it to them. 
So be careful when people start merchandising the anointing. The third thing we want to say about in relation to the anointing is look for the fruit, not just for the performance. What did Jesus say in Matthew 7, 15 to 20? Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their, the size of the tree, how many branches. No, you will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. So, don't evaluate a minister or a ministry by the performance. Today, with video technology, uh, and all the tools we have, the performance can be made to look much better than it really is. And sometimes our, prog- our services are so programmed for performance. Now, there is the genuine, there is the fake. For instance, let's talk about falling under the power. It is true that when you and I encounter the power of God, we will feel weak and we will fall. Very likely you fall flat on your face. But this whole thing can be programmed. And so you have preachers having bodies all over the, you know, whether they actually felt anything or not, the bodies are on the floor here. It looks great on TV. You think it's the anointing. But have you ever wondered what happens to these people once they get up? Are they actually healed? What life do they live after that? What's the point of getting supposedly knocked down on the floor, but you go and live like the devil? What's the point? What's the fruit? I am not against the genuine. But Jesus said, look for the fruit, not the size of the tree. How many branches, how many leaves, how many roots? Look for the fruits. So the question is, what happens to the lives of people? What fruit should a minister of God produce? We just read it when we started. First of all, obviously, if the Holy Spirit is working through him or her, Jesus will always be glorified. John 16, 14, the Holy Spirit always glorifies Jesus. So the result of that ministry is, Lord Jesus, I love you more. What fruit should a minister of God produce? He must equip God's people for work of ministry. If people come and listen and they're not equipped to go out and work for God and serve God, that is not bearing fruit. What fruit must the minister of God bear? He must build up the body of Christ so that we come to the unity of the faith. What fruit must the minister of God bear? He must make us all to be more like Jesus. Come to the full measure of the stature of Christ. So our lives are being changed to become more like Jesus. That's the fruit you're supposed to be looking for. Are you with me so far? So look for the fruits, not the performance. So the challenge today is, is how do I get past all the excitement? Because you can get excited in the cricket fields or in the cricket stadium, in the movie house, and also in church. What's the difference? The difference is, when you get excited here, the presence of God, about the presence of God, about the word of God, your life is changed. That's the fruit we look for. So, look for the fruit. Number four. Do not boast in men. Because we've made ministers of God superstars, just like how people in the world do it. They used to be Amita Bachchan, maybe still around. <laughs> but now it's, I don't know who the latest, you know. People feel excited about, you know, we all these new people on the scene, so forget it. Same thing in the church. 
We want to identify or derive our identity from some superstar preacher. What did the Apostle Paul write to the Corinthians? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. Now by saying this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas or Peter, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Just replace this, those old n- names with the names of current ministers of God. So we say, I, I'm of so-and-so. I'm of so-and-so. I'm of so-and-so. I mean, there's nothing wrong with honoring and recognizing these ministers of God. But your identity does not come from them. Are you listening? And then he continues in chapter 3. He writes to the Corinthians. He says in verses 4 and 5. For when one says, I'm of Paul. Another, I'm of Apollos. Are you not carnal? I mean, you're not behaving like the world. Verse 5. Who then is Paul? Who is Apollos? But ministers through whom you believe as the Lord gave to each one. I mean, these are just human people that God used to bring you to faith in Christ to help you in your walk with God. So what was his instruction? Verse 21. Therefore, let no one boast in man. So I don't want you to boast in man. That's the word of God. But the church is not paying attention to that. We're beginning to boast in apostles so and so and prophets so and so and bishops so and so and whatever. And then he says in chapter 4 and verse 6, Now these things, brethren, I figuratively transfer to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. So one is saying, I am of so and so. Another one is saying, I am of so and so. We are puffed up of one against the other. We are actually dividing the body here. He says, don't do that. Stop elevating one more than the other. How many prophecies did your pastor give? Three. Woo. My pastor gave five. What are you doing? What are you doing? Let no one boast in. Number five, concerning the anointing. Who do you need in your life? Jesus or an anointed minister of God? The latest trend that we're seeing in the church, which is not a nice trend, is that these ministers of God, they aren't genuine ministers of God, but unfortunately, they begin to say things like this. You need to have an apostle in your life. You need to have a prophet in your life. In other words, Indirectly saying, you need to have me in your life. You can hear that. You see, and then they use Old Testament scripture where, of course in the Old Testament, a leader went to the priest. The king went to the prophet. Because in the Old Testament, not everybody had the Holy Spirit. And certain individuals were anointed for certain things. One man was uh, anointed as a leader. Another man was anointed as a priest. Another one was anointed as a king. So the king went to the prophet. That was the Old Testament. You come into the New Testament, the believer has the Holy Spirit living in him and every believer is king and priest. So if you already have the Holy Spirit in you, why do you need a man? They say, no, you have to be connected to the man to get to God. It's not in the New Testament. You are connected to the wine, Jesus. Amen? The Holy Spirit is in you. You have direct access to the Father through the Holy Spirit. So, yes, they're anointed. Yes, God manifests powerful things. But you've got to be careful. Of them making you dependent on them. There is one God and only one mediator between God and men. And that is not the bishop. It's Jesus Christ. Amen. And if you have Jesus, you have direct access to the Father. 
Now let's talk a little bit about impartation. Are you all with me so far? Or is it bouncing over your heads? Now, impartation. What is impartation? Connected to this whole issue or, or area of anointing. Impartation is a true thing in scripture. It means that the grace, the gift, and the anointing that a man of God or woman of God carries can be transferred to other people. It's a valid thing. That means you can receive of what they're carrying. God has designed it that way. So we see examples both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. For instance, in Romans 1.11, Paul is writing to the people at Rome. He says, I want to come to you because I desire to impart to you some spiritual gift. So Paul is telling the believers, I want to come and give, impart something into your life. It's a valid thing. Paul wrote to Timothy. He said, Timothy, you know, stir up the gift of God that is in you, which was given to you through the laying on of hands. So it's a valid thing to impart. It's a valid thing for transfer of spiritual grace gift from uh, these ministries into our lives. It's a valid thing. But we need to understand impartation correctly. Because when we don't understand it correctly, we get into error. Some of the errors you hear is, well, you sow into my anointing, you'll receive something. So where is that in the paper? In other words, they're saying, you give money, you'll get some grace, some measure of the anointing. Sow into my anointing. You have to connect to me to receive anointing. In other words, you know, start sending your money to me. You connect in order to receive the anointing. You have to be careful of these things. And then, you see, I am not against us going and getting prayed for. We pray for people. We impart grace. We do all of that. We ourselves practice that. But sometimes people don't understand things correctly. They think because so-and-so laid hands on them, overnight everything will happen. And then they, you know, suddenly they become from usher to Apostle John. <laughs> like, when did that happen? Oh, I got prayed by so and so. It's like, so from, you went from being ushered to apostle? I mean, people, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating that, but there are instances. And we misunderstand this whole truth about impartation. And so, I'm going to present 11 statements, truths, concerning the impartation. I'll go through it quickly, so don't worry. You're getting, your chicken won't roast to death, you know. Still be fine in the oven, but let me say, let's say these things. Number one, impartation is always aligned to God's call and assignment on your life. What does that mean? Doesn't matter how much I want to become a worship leader, and doesn't matter whether I go to Australia, I go to Bethel, or I go to Hillsong, or wherever, and get all those people lay hands on me, I will never become a worship leader. Unless God has called me to that. Are you understanding? Is it plain enough? Doesn't matter who lays hands on you. If you're not called to it, it's not going to happen. Because the impartation is always aligned to the call of God and the assignment that God has for your life. If you're not called to be a worship leader, Kim Walker, darling, check and pour barrels of oil on you, lay hands on you, both the hands, nothing will happen. It won't happen. Maybe you will experience more of God's presence if you, in your private worship. But your assignment doesn't change. So understand that truth. That impartation align comes according to God's call on you. Number two, impartation often takes place in a measure. That means a man of God can be anointed with different graces and gifts on his life. When he lays hands on you, it's not a full package transfer. A part, a portion of what he's carrying is what is coming into your life. Moses, God said, I'll take up the spirit that's on you and put on 70 elders. That doesn't mean now Israel had 71 Moseses. There was only one Moses. And the 70 elders had to take care of their regular job of taking care of the people. 
But they received what was on Moses' life, a part of it. Moses laid hands on Joshua. Joshua did not become Moses. Joshua only received the spirit of wisdom that was on Moses. I understand. It was a measure that was transferred to fit into his call. The Bible says that John the Baptist came in the spirit and power of Elijah. It was a transfer. Elijah did many miracles. He called fire down from heaven. He raised the dead. He multiplied oil. John the Baptist, there is no record, there is no record of any miracle in his life. But only one commonality was Elijah, when he ministered, people turned back to the Lord. They said, the Lord, he is God. John the Baptist did the same thing. He prepared the people. He turned their hearts ready for God. That was the transfer. To prepare a people for the coming of the Lord. A transfer in measure. Number three. Impartation. Everything received through impartation has to be nurtured and developed. Just because somebody laid hands on you doesn't mean every, you become that person the next day. It does not happen that way. You receive that grace in your life. You receive that anointing in your life. But you've got to nurture and develop it in your own life. That's why Paul wrote to Timothy. He said, Timothy, do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you through prophecy and the laying on of hands. Don't neglect it and use it. And then he writes again in 2 Timothy 1. He says, stir up the gift of God that is in you, which was given to you through laying on of hands. I was, you got to do something with this. Don't neglect it. you got to nurture it. you got to build it up. So, you go have a prophet pray for you. Doesn't mean you're going to prophesy like him the next minute. There's an impartation of grace, but you've got to be trained. You've got to attend weekend school. To understand the prophetic and begin to take baby steps in it. Are you listening? You have to develop. You have to nurture those things. Number four. You can grow beyond what was imparted, both in measure and realms. That means somebody prays over you, they impart to you. Of course, you can develop, but you can grow beyond it. That's not a ceiling that you can only grow to that level. You can go beyond it. And you can also increase in realms. That means uh, uh, one grace was imparted to you, but you can have grown many graces in your life and, 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 and just be able to minister in many number of ways. Number five, let me just go quickly. Uh, you can receive impartation from more than one minister of God. So there's nothing wrong in having many different people pray for you. To receive grace. Number six, two factors de determine what you receive through impartation. Your hunger and God's assignment. So you've got to be hungry in order to receive. If you're not hungry, people can lay hands on you, push you down, make you stand up, do all those things, nothing will change. Because you're not receiving. So being hungry and the call of God will determine that. Number seven, Impartation takes place through association and honor. That means you need to connect. Uh, uh, when I say connect, meaning you receive from that person. Receive the teaching. Receive what God is re releasing to that person in, in whole, in, in wholesome way. And that's asso associating with that ministry. And you honor that. You respect that ministry. But remember, in the right place. Don't you know, put that person up on a pedestal. But you receive through what they're teaching. You receive the word of God being ministered through their lives. And, and, and that's how you associate and you honor the work. Number eight, impartation can take place remotely. So you could be in one place, you're following a ministry somewhere else, and impartation is taking place. Because there is no distance in the realm of the spirit you can receive. Number nine, impartation cannot be purchased with money. You heard me say this last Sunday, just repeating it again. In Acts 8, verse 18 to 22, it says, Simon saw Peter, that to the laying hands of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given. So he offered them money. Saying, give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, your money perish with you. Because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. So Peter, uh, so Peter tells Simon, Simon, this is not going to work. So Simon says, impart, impart, give me the spiritual ability. I want to lay hands. I want to see the same thing. How much you want? Peter says, you can't buy this with money. You can't buy the gift of God with money. So be careful when people say, give me money, you'll get my grace. Doesn't work that way. You receive from God freely by his, uh, you know, by God's own doing in response to your hunger and faith. Last two points. Number 10, a double portion can only be received from God. When Elisha told Elijah, 
I want a double portion of what you have. I want twice as much as what you have. Elijah's response was, you've asked for a very difficult thing. Just keep your eyes on me as I go up. But you're going to receive from God. Elijah didn't lay hands on him and say, take a double portion. He couldn't do that. Because you can't give what you don't have. So the double portion is always received from God. So people come and say, Pastor, I want a double portion of what you have. It's like, please go to God. <laughs> It's like, what? I mean, if it was that easy, I'll keep, you know, exponentially double portioning myself. You know? <laughs> it's not that easy, man. So it'll be an exponential growth, you know. <laughs> Last point. Impartation can take place across generations. So we see the example of the spirit of, and power of Elijah coming on John the Baptist thousands of years apart. But yet there was a transfer of that grace and anointing. And so that also can happen. So why did we do these three mess series of message, three, the series of three messages, which are somewhat hard and difficult? For this one reason, Ephesians 4, 14, 15, Paul says, We no longer want you to be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine. We don't want you to be like that, you know. Just toss to and fro. Somebody says something new, you get carried away by that. Somebody says something new, you get carried away by that. No. Don't be tossed here and there. But instead, focus on Jesus. Verse 15, he says, We must grow up in all things to be like. That's the focus. Lord, I want to grow up to be like you. Not carried away by all these things here and there. People say, uh, and every wind of doctrine that blows through the church I don't want to be carried away by that. Amen? So I hope this morning we've understood how to look at ministers. How, what, is, what must I look for? Their lifestyle. What is the correct understanding of the anointing? There's a few things we talked about and about impartation. In understanding this, now we can rightly relate to God's servants, the ministers of God. Yes, we honor them. Yes, there are valid things that happen by His Spirit, but we must learn to relate correctly and the body of christ will be built up amen let's rise to our feet please i'll just call our worship team up we'll take a few moments to pray and then we close let's take a few moments to pray as you look to god ask him for grace for empowering for anointing for what he has assigned for your life To every man, every woman, every person, God has given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. And pray, say, God, I want to recognize what have you placed in me. I want to fulfill that, God. I want to stay true. I want to stay true for God's assignment on my life. I want to fulfill your assignment for me. Will you take a moment to pray? And God, empower me by your Holy Spirit to fulfill that. To fulfill your assignment for my life. Father, I just thank you for each person here. And thank you, Father, that you have a plan, you have a purpose. You have a call on each one. And pray for grace, for anointing, for empowering over each one of our lives. That we will be equipped thoroughly by your word and by your spirit to do what you've called us to do, God. To be fruitful in our lives. To be effective for the purposes of your kingdom. Holy Spirit, release mighty things through each of our lives. Release mighty things through each of our lives. Make us fearless. Make us bold for the sake of Jesus Christ. May we bear good fruit, good fruit for the kingdom. Let people see Jesus through the fruit we bear. Let people be drawn to Jesus 
to the fruit our lives bear. And whatever we do, may there be fruit that draws people to you. Thank you, O oh God. Thank you. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you. There's an empowering of God's Holy Spirit for everything that God has called us to do. If you're a student, there's an empowering of the Holy Spirit there. If you're a businessman, there's an empowering there. If you're a sports person, the Holy Spirit empowers you. Whatever you do, there's an empowering of the Holy Spirit. And we want the Spirit of God to empower us. When the Holy Spirit empowers you, God's glory will be displayed through your life. So let's sing it again. This time sing it very personal. Say, Holy Spirit, I need you. I want you. Your presence, Lord. 
So, Father God, we just pray that each one of us will grow in the grace, the gifting, and the anointing that's placed on us and within us, Father. And each one of us will grow, and each one of us bear much fruits for your kingdom. And I pray this blessing for each of our lives. Let's close, please. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet communion of His Holy Spirit continue with us always. In Jesus' name, amen. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also visit our website apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.